Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're back for another show after a heck of a road swing for the Flames. I'm Dan, and as always, Matt's here with me. How you doing, Matt? Good. It was a good game. It was. Good game, good road swing. And you know, the weirdest thing, if you take a look, it's been almost one year to the day. It was January 18th last year. The Flames and the Canucks played and had the big bench-clearing brawl that we all remember, where Tortorella got in Hartley's face and everybody right at the beginning of the game got into it. And if we look at the team since then, there's been a very different Calgary Flames team on the ice since that happened. Yeah, they've been a lot more cohesive and bonding together as a team and having that caring for each other on the ice and wanting everybody to succeed. Whereas the Flames before were kind of like a group of individuals. Well, I mean, that was the Flames' MO for a while, was a bunch of freelancers. I mean, we saw that during the Jerome McGinley era and that sort of thing. And really, after that fight, I mean, I think the Flames have been playing at a playoff pace since that happened. I think they're, they were like two or three points off a of playoff pace since that point. And even for a team that last year was not a very good team. I mean, the Flames had a lot of lows last year, not as many highs. After that point, I remember actually really enjoying watching the team because it just seemed to wake them all up. Mm -hmm. And it's carried over right through this season, and if you look at the Flames on paper since that point, and compare them to the rest of the league, this team isn't a top-tier team, and yet we've been playing pretty much at a top-tier level since then. Yeah, it's really weird how that one incident seemed to have almost changed not only the way the players play, but the identity of the team. Like, I think... Since then, the Flames have really come into their own as a roster. Mm-hmm. And everybody is buying into what Bob Hartley is trying to get them to do, and it's good to see. Yeah, so interesting note that that was a year ago. Um, hopefully we don't need another bench-clearing brawl to you know get momentum back up this year and next year, but it's interesting that that event seems to be what we can trace all of the Flames' success recently back to. Speaking of success, the Flames have had a four-game road swing that I think we're all surprised they come away with four wins. They played against the Canucks on the 10th, and then they had a four-day break. After being the Canucks 1-0, they went on to beat the Arizona Coyotes 4-1. They beat the San Jose Sharks 4-3. And last night, in a thrilling overtime, they ended up beating the reigning champions, the LA Kings, 2-1. Are you surprised we're coming back with Ordeo getting as many starts as he has and the flames winning as many as they have. Well, honestly, if it was not for Yanni Ordeo, I think the flames only come away out of those four games with only the single win against Arizona. He has just basically channeled his inner Mika Kiprasov and has run with it. And he will be getting the start tomorrow against the Anaheim ducks as well. That'll be his fifth start in a row, right? Yes. You know, and this is what you want to see for any team, but especially a rebuilding team, is for a player like Ordeo to make the coaches make a hard decision. You don't want to carry three goalies. No, but as Bob Hartley said, the Flames have been having the mantra of earned, not given. And with how Ordeo played against Vancouver, how do you say, oh, well, no, you can go back to Adirondack. You can't. And then he does the same thing against Arizona. Then he does the same thing against San Jose. Then he does the same thing against Los Angeles. And maybe he'll be the guy that can break the Honda Center curse for us. Well, the thing is, is that the Flames, four of their last five wins in Anaheim have come in the middle of January. So hopefully that holds true. (laughs) Hopefully. You know, and, and I think it, if I was Kerry Ramo, I think this would start to make me nervous because I think we can all agree that Ramo was the backup this year. I mean, if you look at the way the goaltending broke down, it wasn't really a 1A, 1B. I think Ramo is probably the backup. And with Ordeo showing what he's showing, I think that Ramo might be one of the guys the Flames would be shopping as the deadline approaches. Yeah, and it's unfortunate because you don't like to see 
players lose their spot, but Ramo is an unrestricted free agent at the end of the season, and Ordeo has played the best of any of the goaltenders this year in the last four games. And I think the nice thing about Ramo is there always seems to be a market coming towards the deadline for really good goaltenders. And I think Ramo is kind of on that upper end of backup goaltenders. He's probably not ready to be a starter for a playoff team, but I think he's a good proven backup guy you could slot in there. So I think the Flames could get something perhaps, hopefully, to help show up the blue line for him. I think he could bring us a nice return. Well, he's probably in the 25 to 35 range of goaltenders. So basically, if you look around the league, any team that's going into the playoffs that doesn't have a quality backup like the New York Islanders or even the Nashville Predators losing Pekka Rene for a month, they could probably use someone like Ramo. And it depends on the return. And, you know, if you only get even a third or a second round pick, that's better than nothing. It's weird that uh, with Ordeo's play that this is even a conversation. I don't think anybody anticipated Ordeo coming in and basically stealing the number one job. No, I mean, I, I think we all expected he'd probably come in after the deadline if the Flames weren't doing well and they'd give him a couple starts like they did last year. But, you know, he was brought in as a replacement for uh, the injured Ramo. And I don't think anybody expected him to get more than one start before they send him back down. He'd be sitting on the bench mostly behind Hiller. So it's really great to see that we have these young players, as we've seen with Josh Juris and Granlin and now Ordeo, who are coming in and stealing jobs. Yeah, and I'm glad that the Flames are keeping their mantra of earned and not given and allowing a, a guy like Ordeo to come in. Oh, well, we have two starting goaltenders, but you're playing better than the pair of them, so it's your job now. And what a great problem to have. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's GMs around the league that would kill to have, you know, a great pair, much less a great trio. Exactly. And hopefully the Flames can find a spot for Ramo if they do keep Ordeo on the roster. Because you don't want to see the Flames running with three goaltenders for an extended period of time. No, well, and, and after the Ducks game, we have a five-day break. And I have a feeling that's where they're going to sit down and really decide as an organization what they want to do. Uh, the deadline is late this year. It's in March. So we have just over a month to make moves. But... I think that they'll probably decide as a management group by the end of January what they're going to do with their goalies and who is going to stay and who they want to start shopping. Mm -hmm. If you look at those three, would you be shopping Hiller or would you be shopping Ramo? Honestly, it would depend on the return. And I would probably trade whomever gets you the better return. Like if somebody offers you a first round pick for Jonas Hiller and you're only going to get a third for... Kari Ramo, honestly, I'd probably take the first, even though Hiller has been the better of the two guys. See, to me, I think the big thing is that Ramos, if they were both under at least one year or two year contracts, I, I would agree with you. But I would be worried to trade Hiller and have Ramo not come back, and then we lose them both. Well, the thing is that if you offered Ramo, like the same contract or even bump them up a little bit to like say three and a half million dollars i'm sure that he's looking around the league and there's not really going to be a, a better opportunity to possibly start and he'd be fighting with ordeo for that spot just as he's been fighting with hiller for it yeah you could be right because there hasn't been a lot of open spots like look at uh martin brodeur and how long it took him to find a spot exactly yeah no that's true and and i think i i just think as a goaltender if you're gonna get a spot it'll be in the off season i think that ramo becoming a ufa there might be a team that says yeah okay we'll bring this guy in as a ufa he's younger than broder and i think one of broder's issues was his, was his age mm -hmm. oh i agree and you know, it's one of those things that you'd have to evaluate exactly, like, what the offers are. Like, if it's close, you'd probably deal Ramo just because 
Hiller's under contract, but if, like, there's a significant divide, then it becomes more of a toss-up. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Um, I don't think these three guys are all going to be in wearing Flaming C's or even Flaming A's in Adirondack by, the, by March 3rd. Um, I think someone's got to go. And I am I hope that Yanni Ordeo can seize an NHL spot for the rest of this year and next year. It's great to see that we have another Finnish goalie who is showing such great promise. Exactly. And anytime you can get a goaltender that's been playing like Ordeo has, that's the whole thing. Like You need to have a goaltender that can reliably steal a game for you. And Ordeo's done it three times out of the four games. See, the thing that I think, and I mean, we're looking at Yanni Ordeo now in January, and I think the thing we have to remember is this guy's a slow starter. I mean, last year he started in the ECHL. This year he looked really bad at the beginning of the year. And I think if he's going to win a spot here, he's got to fix that because you don't want to bring in a guy, especially a backup, who when you put him in, you need him to play, and he stinks for the first two months of the year. True, and that will definitely have to be something that he makes an adjustment on, but unfortunately you can't see how he will respond. Like, each of the last two seasons, Ordeo was kind of coming in trying to win a spot in the off season, and then the Flames have Barra, then they get Hiller, so like he's kind of lost his potential roster spot. So, who knows, maybe if he comes in knowing that, yes, I am going to be in the NHL this season right from the get-go, maybe that changes his attitude and his level of play right off the bat. Yeah, but at the same time, I think knowing that we have to have a plan B in case it doesn't, we have to have a guy who is still capable of doing that. True, Uh, but you'd likely just sign some like AHL caliber guy like it, you know that you could slide to the AHL if need be you'd almost want a guy like a Martin Rodeur who okay you're starting the season here great Ordeo's you know picked up his game he's ready to go now you're going down to the A if we lose you to waivers no big deal yeah or like a guy like Joey McDonald or you know yeah exactly insert that tier of guy yeah, no, you're right, that kind of guy. Yeah, someone who is a reliable NHLer, but who you don't plan to be there all year. That's not a long-term solution, but I just think that we have to remember that Ordeo it hasn't been perfect all year, and I think for him to win a job, that's the biggest thing that he's going to have to correct in the offseason. Yeah, and you would need to have an insurance guy there just in case, plus likely Adirondack or Stockton or whatever, wherever the Flames farm team is next year. They're going to need a guy to be the starter. I don't know as if the Flames are going to sign John Gillies out of the NCAA. So the the goaltending situation down there is going to be a little murky anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, if you look at the... I'm also thinking about Kerry Ramo here. If you look at the goaltenders that are going to be available this summer, I think that Ramo could probably get a good payday. Um, I think Victor Faust is going to be available, and he's probably the only other goaltender who might get some top money um, on July 1st. So I think that if you are Ramo, signing with the Flames now might not be in your best interest. It might be best to hold out and wait and see what you could get in the summer. So by that logic, it makes sense for the Flames to trade him as a rental. Yeah, it depends, really. Like, Who would have thought that somebody would offer a second-round pick for Red O'Bara last year? That's true. So you don't know exactly what Just call the... Patrick Waugh again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't know exactly what the offers are on the table because we're not in management. So it's hard to speculate. Like someone might have a real hard on for Jonas Hiller and want to make them him their starter, and will offer accordingly. Who knows? It, it <laughs> you know, you don't know. I think that we will start to see after this break that the Flames have on the 27th when we get Buffalo coming to town and then uh, Minnesota and Edmonton. I think if Ordeo is not still playing, I think you'll start to get a sense of who they want to move based on who they play because I think you're going to want to show off any goaltender that you're trying to move and try to sell. 
Yeah, exactly. So if we all of a sudden see Ramo get three starts in a row, that's probably a sign they're trying to shop him. True. Well, we've had a great week from Ordeo, as we mentioned, and it really, I agree with you. I think it was really the thing that um, that cemented for us this four-game win streak on the road. And fans have been crazy about the streak. I mean, it just keeps going, and the team has looked good. And even though they haven't played great 60-minute games, we're remembering the, the finishes. I mean, even last night in uh, in L.A., you could argue the Flames didn't play a great game, but everyone remembers that the finish on that game. Matt, do you think that this four-game road streak, where we are now and where we are in the season, kind of erases the eight-game losing streak we went on in in December? Yeah, yes and no. Uh, realistically, that eight-game losing streak and even some of the games that preceded it where the Flames had that stretch where like we kept coming back in the last minute... I think between everything, it kind of balances out. Like, there were games that on that eight game win or losing streak that we should have won. And probably there have been some wins where we really didn't deserve two points. So I think over the course of the 82 game schedule, it does balance out. But this four game streak, I don't think makes up the eight game losing streak i think it's just kind of we're getting good bounces at different times and we had a streak where we weren't getting any bounces well and as Derek willis on uh, fan 960 likes to say he calls this team the find away flames and he i think he's right i mean this team is not playing complete 60 minute games every night but yet they're finding a way to get the win and that is a sign that you know i mean we're not seeing great hockey for 60 minutes from a top caliber team which we all know we're not this year but the fact they can find a way to get the two points in the end all that really matters is the two points yeah the resiliency that the flames have shown uh, even bouncing back uh immediately following the eight game losing streak and winning the next four games and then losing a couple and then winning four more they're not just collapsing and fall fading into the ether and like okay we're we're gonna suck again and you know like that's it for the season trade everybody off that's it <laughs> pack at home you know they're rebounding even within games where like the matt green goal last night right after the flames were relentless and eventually scored the equalizer and it's good to see because eventually, like once we do get the talent to go along with the effort, that'll make the Flames one of the most dangerous teams in the league. Yeah, it will. I agree with you. I don't think that this four-game streak erases the eight-game win streak, but I think next year or in f- future years when you look back at this season, we're going to remember this four-game win streak, and we're not going to remember the eight-game losing streak. I don't think anyone's going to look back and remember that you know, eight games in a row where this team stunk. I think if we're going to remember anything and anything's going to stick out, it's going to be, you know, the Yoni Ordeo road trip. Mm -hmm. So I think from that perspective, this is going to be one of the things we look back on when we think of the 2014, 2015 season. And we remember this road trip. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's nice to get those points. It kind of makes up some of the ones we lost in the road trip. And I agree. There's some games on this trip. We shouldn't have won. And there's some games during that eight game losing streak that we should have won so i think you know the hockey gods if you will are keeping everything equal yeah over the course of an 82 game schedule things tend to level out and teams tend to finish where they're supposed to like you get the odd team that like edmonton back when they last made the playoffs in 0506 like, they won- lost a lot of games in overtime in the shootout, and, like, that's how they managed to squeak in. Well, that wasn't indicative of how they played, and that's one of the few outliers in probably the last decade. But most of everybody else finishes right where they're supposed to. Speaking of finishing, uh, if we look at the standings as of today, this show's being recorded on the 20th of January, the Flames are right now sitting in a playoff spot. We're sitting in the number two wild card spot in the Western Conference with 53 points. LA's behind us by one point with 52, and San Jose's one point above us with 54. So 
if the Flames can keep winning, even if we don't go on, you know, a six or eight game win streak here, as long as we keep winning at the pace we have been, uh, our last 10 or 7, 3 and 0 oh for the last 10, I think that, you know, there's not much chance of the Flames really falling out of contention here. No, and the important segment of the season is going to be in February. Like, all of the games are against good teams, with the exception of New Jersey. And we don't have a lot of breaks there either. If you look at no. this month, we've had a lot of four or five game, five day breaks. In February, we're pretty much playing every other day. Yeah, they play a dozen times in the 28 days, so... There's a couple of two day breaks in there, but yeah, it's pretty much. But then much those every get offset night. by like a back to back. Yeah. Where if you look at this month, I mean, we've had like a four day break. We have a, a five day break coming up. So the Flames have had lots of rest this month. Yeah. And the fact that they're going up against a bunch of exceptional teams, you know, they're going to have to find ways to hold on, really. And, like, if they even make it through February 6 and 6, like, that should set them up to make a good run for the playoffs after that. Yeah. Well, if we look at some of their opponents in February, I mean, the first week we've got uh, the Penguins coming to town. We see the Kings again in the second week. We see the Bruins, who are seeing the Ducks again at home. And we, we end the night by taking, or we end the month, sorry, by taking on the Islanders. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of good teams there, and I think you're right. I mean, we said this before. We've said this, you know, every month that, well, this is a must-win month or this is a must-win um, series. But, yeah, I think that's really going to be where, as the race starts to tighten here in points, that could make or break us. But I think if we can finish off the month of January strong, it's going to help with some cushioning there. Yeah. Exactly, and the fact that the Flames play the Oilers and the Sabres, who are both mired in their own <laughs> purgatory, <laughs> so that hopefully they can get two wins out of there, and if they can win one of the other two games, that should give them enough of a spread, so that way if they do have a weaker month in February, they'll still be close enough where in March, which is an easier month, to make up the difference. Yeah, I mean, even if we take a look at the next five games, we've got the Ducks tomorrow night, which it's debatable if we're going to walk away with a win there. Um, we, we've we got the Sabres next week, as you said, should be an easy win. I think the Flames can beat the Wild next week. Um, mm -hmm. The Oilers we can beat. And then even starting off February, we've got the Jets and the Sharks, both of which are winnable games if we want to win them. Like, if we see this team play well, I think they can beat both of those teams. So in the next what, four or five, six games, I think that five of the six games are winnable. Yeah, and the Flames will just have to come out and play their game, and if they can maintain the level of play that they have, they should be able to win... A a majority of those games and even through February most of the games are against teams that are close in the standings to them so hopefully they can just keep up the effort and get timely scoring and all that and carry on yeah and I think if we're going to see any major moves made with this team it's going to be in mid to late February I think that they're going to want to get things done before the deadline on the second, I think, especially with the non-deal with Camilleri last year. They're not going to want to wait and miss out on something. So I think that within the next month, we're going to see some changes made to this roster as well, which might put a little bit of a dent in our streak as you know, start to have to get new chemistry and stuff. That might give us a couple losses in a row as well. Well, also, with Glenn Cross being out, it gives the Flames a bit of an opportunity to see what life would be like without him. It's a good point. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Yeah, we get to see what it's like without having Glennie on the ice right now. Yeah, like, are they going to be struggling over the next couple of weeks, or however long Glenn Cross is out, with generating offense? Like, if they don't skip a beat, then you could delete Glenn Cross from the lineup through trade and not really have too much of an impact. Yeah, and it, I think it also lets us see with the team rocking the way they are who we might want to bring in to replace them. We're not going to have to make an emergency replacement, but be it 
someone from the farm or someone by trade, it gives us a little bit of time to strategize there as well. Exactly. Well, speaking of uh, Glenn Cross being out, the Flames made a number of roster moves today that we should probably mention. We had one guy taken on off the IR, which was Kerry Ramo. He's now been activated and back into uh, full-time duty. And he was replaced on the IR by Lottie, Lottie Smead, who is hurt again. Um, it's an upper body injury this time. It seems it seems like Smead's had a rough season. Yeah, he was hit late in the game by Jordan Nolan. I saw and that it looked like he got a shoulder to the face, which if that's a second concussion, usually if a player suffers two back-to-back like Smead might have, usually it takes a long time for the player to come back. Yeah, and I think there's rules around that too, that after so many concussions in a row, the league puts in more strict rules around coming back. Yeah, so I think that's why Watherspoon was recalled instead of a guy that would be a more temp fill-in like a Corey Potter. Yeah, so there's the other move that Matt announced is uh, Tyler Watherspoon was called up. Now, Bob Hartley apparently has said that Diaz will play tomorrow night against the Ducks. Watherspoon is not likely to play, which... Makes sense to me. Let the guy, you know, practice for a bit, get his feet under him. Um, Kind of an odd call up with the big break coming up. Maybe I would have brought up Potter, you know, just for one game or maybe not. Maybe you want him there to practice with the team. But, yeah, I think that you'll probably see Watherspoon slot in the lineup before the end of January. And hopefully there's another guy in Watherspoon that can earn himself a job. Exactly. And you and I have both been watching all of Adirondack's games, and he has been the rock for Adirondack's defense core. Yeah, some nights he seems to be the only defenseman who I can isolate on the ice. Like, a lot of the guys just seem like they're going through the motions, and a lot of times number five is the only guy I can look at and actually pick out and say, there's a defenseman that I'm noticing. He's doing the right things. Yeah, it's not noticeable because, oh, he screwed up again. (laughs) Well, that's it, and it's not like he's just, you know, going through the motions like sometimes it seems like their defensive core is. He's always, well, not always, but a good portion of the time you're noticing him because he's done something right. Yeah, like he'll cut off a guy or he'll make the right transitional play and all that. Exactly. And for Flames fans, Watherspoon is primarily a defensive defenseman who can make a good pass, so... He's not going to be like a next Chris Russell type guy. He's more of a Ladislav Smead, but he can make that good transition pass. He's from Surrey, BC. He was drafted in 2011 by the Flames in the second round. Um, he's six foot one, 203 pounds. So a, a little bit of a bigger guy there. Not a huge guy, but a little bit of a bigger guy. He is, I think, the guy that we knew coming into the season was the the first call up as far as prospects go for the flames. I think that we all knew Potter would be the first call up in in the case of a quick injury because he's the senior guy there, but coming in Watherspoon is the shining star right now, as far as blue line prospects go. Exactly. And he was the last guy cut last year too, I think. Yeah. And he has been the mainstay. So it's not like you're going to see him come in and flounder. He has 15 points in 38 games with Adirondack, so like he, he can generate some offense. And even last year, he was solid in the games he did play, so hopefully he can just transition smoothly and take a spot. Yeah, and with the success the Flames seem to be having so far this season with call-up guys earning a spot, I'm really hoping that he's going to push somebody out. Exactly. And if he can play at a reasonably good level, I don't see why he wouldn't take a spot. Like, he is quicker than both Smead and England. He can make a pass. So if he can play effectively at the NHL level, then he should be able to supplant one of them. See, I think if he's going to push it when I was going to be Diaz. Diaz has kind of been the extra defenseman all year. I think he was honestly signed because they didn't feel they had enough depth at the NHL level going into the season. So I think he's also cheap. He's the guy that we might see who gets re, re, um, who gets sent down to the AHL or who gets traded as part of a package. I think it's going to be tough to supplant England simply because of his contract. Yeah, but you would likely see one of those two guys getting slid down to the seventh spot. That's true, yeah. 
And, you know, I think that even for the rest of the season, you could carry eight defensemen if, you know, Watherspoon's doing well and just don't play one very much for, you know, after the deadline when the roster limit goes away. But, yeah, I think that I think that it's definitely possible for him to make a spot of uh, either Smead's job, Diaz's job, or England's job. Yeah, and it's up to him, really, just like all the other prospects. If you play, you will take a spot, so... Hopefully he does so. And for those that are looking for him, you'll see Tyler Watherspoon wearing number 26 for the Flames. He's 21 years old, a nice young prospect, and it'll be great to see what they've got there on the blue line. We really haven't seen much movement from our blue line team. I mean, we saw Corey Potter come up. I don't even know if he played a game when they recalled no, him. No, this. Okay. So we really haven't seen you know much in the way of injuries on the blue line, so this is really our first look at some of the d- defensive prospects. Yep, that's good to see the Flames D getting some opportunities. Yeah. It, like, uh, if you look at the forward group, like, we had five or six guys get hurt, so at least, like, with those guys, you had a, an opportunity to cycle a whole bunch of guys through. Well, and we're also much deeper on the forward ranks. I think if we had three or four defensemen get hurt, we wouldn't be able to backfill from our farm. I don't know that we have three or four, you know, AHL defenseman who we could play consistently for you know six eight games at the nhl level right now yeah like uh, other than potter and maybe nolan yonkman i don't think there's anybody else beyond that i don't even think yonkman signed they'd have to sign him i think he's in an ahl deal yeah he is and they would have to sign him but you know like if three or four guys went down i think you're kind of in desperation mode let's throw yeah. anybody in there that <laughs> See, I mean, looking at the team going into this, when you and I were at training camp, I was hoping Seeloff was going to have a better season than he than he did. I've been a Seeloff fan for a while. He's just, I don't know, he's not looking like what I thought. We look at guys like Culkin and Kulak, not really ready yet. Akalatsi is not an NHL player. Kandari is, I think, a bust at this point. So, yeah, we really don't have a lot of top-flight defensemen besides Watherspoon and maybe Potter. Yeah, and that's one of the things that the Flames will need to address in the future, but we'll see. And like with the Flames trading Corbin Knight for Drew Shore, we have seen the Flames management move a guy to address a situation where we were weak in. Because Shore, while he is currently listed as a center, he could hypothetically be shoved over to the right wing because he is a right-handed shot, so... Well, it seems kind of funny for the Flames to acquire another forward. I mean, we're deep on forwards, so as I've been thinking more about the shore deal since we broadcast last week, I thought, you know what, to me, maybe this is setting up the Flames moving a forward prospect for a defensive prospect. Yeah, exactly. Kind of backfilling that role with Shore. Yeah, and Shore is more likely going to be an NHL player than Knight, so you could get away with trading off another higher level prospect, whomever, you know, pick any of the guys, really, <laughs> and moving them for a defenseman. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and I oh, that's the other move we should announce, speaking of Drew Shore, is Drew Shore has been sent back to the AHL at this point. Um, mostly just because of his waiver status, I would imagine. I think he has one game left before he has to clear waivers. Exactly. And and I doubt he's going to clear waivers. Oh, no, he wouldn't. And realistically, he would need some more time to learn the flame system. And with Adirondack and Calgary both playing the same way, he'll get that opportunity. When he did play against Arizona, he did look a little out of place in terms of his positioning so and that's just a matter of time yeah and there's no rush on him i mean you know he's one of these guys that when we do bring him up he's got to stay here just because of his waiver status so i think he's a guy you'll see stay in the ahl for a little bit longer so we can make sure that he's the guy we want yeah and he looked like an nhl player in the one game that he played for calgary he was probably one of the better forwards that night so if and when uh, a spot becomes available, either through trading off some players or whatever, you know, he should be able to slot in and play effectively. I was going to say, I think that with Drew Shore joining this roster now, 
the depth chart on Ford has, has changed. And I think that you may see that the Flames trade a couple forwards before the deadline this year and Drew Shore ends up getting a job. Exactly. And the thing is, is that having guys like Juris, Granlund, Berchi, Poirier, Sam Bennett, all basically being ready to become full-time NHL players, you're going to have to find spots on the roster for them. And guys like Glenn Cross, maybe guys like Paul Byron are going to have to go. And yeah. that's not because they're bad. It's just that are those players going to be on your team in four years? And realistically, no. So, And I think as well, when you look around the AHL, I mean, if you look at a great season like Emile Poirier's having, you might look and say that a guy, and, you know, even some of our centermen we've called up, like uh, Granlin, you know, guys like Juris, I think that the Flames might have to make a hard decision and say, a guy like Max Reinhardt, does he have more value as a flame or as a tradable asset. Exactly. And, you know, like a team like Buffalo or the Islanders, because they have his brothers, they might be more inclined to give more for him. And the good thing with both of those teams is that they are extremely deep with defensemen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like they have eight or nine guys that are NHL caliber prospects. So you could hypothetically trade a guy like Reinhardt for an NHL caliber guy coming the other way. Yeah, and I mean, a year ago, I wouldn't have said trade Reinhardt because he was looking like one of the better pieces ready to make the jump, but it seems like there's guys, especially Josh Juris, who've jumped over him in the depth chart. You know, Drew Shore is probably higher than him in the depth chart now. So you got to start asking yourself, hey, where is their value and which pieces, as much as we don't want to see them go necessarily, and you know, you want to collect all the prospects when you're in a rebuild, but... Where can we get value to bring in pieces we're lacking? Yeah, and the the unfortunate thing is is that the Flames probably have about 15 to 20 NHL caliber prospects on their forward ranks. Mm-hmm. Well, there's only 12 spots. And that means that you're going to have to make decisions who's the best and keep those guys and move the rest. And unfortunately, a guy like Reinhardt is seeming to fall down the depth chart. So... We do need another defenseman or several, and we need some goaltending if Ordeo stays up. So maybe, you know, you start looking at moving guys like Augustino, Reinhardt. Well, that's it. If I look down the roster in in Adirondack right now, I really, I'm looking at pieces I think we could get a decent return for. And I think the all the pieces that we could get a decent return for are currently wearing flaming seas here in Calgary. I mean, you got guys like, you know, Kalkin, Akalazzi, um, Ramage, Setaguchi. Those guys aren't going to get you much. Um, Turner Elson, I want to st- stick around here for another year or so. Mark Kandari is not going to get you much. Agostino might. Um, Furland, I want to keep around. Poirier, I'd want to keep around. Barchi, I want to keep around. Hanowski, I'd be willing to trade. You're not going to get much for Silov. You're not going to get much for Doug Carr. You're not going to get much for Corey Potter, Dave Wolf, maybe Bill Arnold. Um, but, I mean, there's, I think, all the guys you would look at as the top flight prospects are already at, on the NHL roster. By and large. And, you know, like, it's not like you're going to evacuate all the, the, the forward depth just because. No. But you do have to make decisions. And,. Like a guy like Reinhardt, who is a center, the Flames have about seven guys that are better centers right now than him. Yeah. And, you know, you can use a right winger, you can use a defenseman, you can use a goaltender. Is that Reinhardt being on Adirondack better than acquiring a guy who might have a viable spot in the NHL? Yeah, and I mean, those are, you know, and it's weird to be in that spot right now, I think, in a rebuild, because generally when you're rebuilding, you just want to collect as many young players as you can and kind of sort out who's going to make the roster later. So we're almost in this really weird spot of being in the rebuild mode, but also building this team almost like we're coming out of the rebuild at the same time, where we're starting to look at our prospects and say, okay, who can we move at this point for, you know, prospects that are closer to being ready or, you know, draft picks? It's a really weird place the flames are in right now 
Yeah, and then you gotta figure that we have guys like Hunter Smith and Mark Jankowski. And... Who aren't even in the AHL yet. Exactly. And, like, Hunter Smith's gonna need a spot next year, because mm-hmm. he's an overager. And Jankowski's likely gonna get signed. So, you know, then you got even more of a logjam, and okay, now what? <laughs> and, you know, those decisions will have to be made sooner than later. And, you know, it makes the decisions even tougher because Adirondack is fairly successful this year. You know, if they were just stinking, it would be easy to say, well, none of these guys are really doing much. It doesn't matter who we move. But both teams are very successful, which you don't see a lot of either. No, and the Adirondack Flames are one of the youngest teams in the entire AHL, and yet they're one of the top teams. Yeah. So, you know, at the same time, you got to be careful because you don't want to disrupt that chemistry. I'm a big believer that you should be training them to win at all levels. I know some people say, well, it doesn't matter if they win or lose at the AHL level, but I think you need to be competitive no matter what level you're playing at. So there's going to be a fine balance there for Troll Living and his staff to figure out who do we move without really disrupting that team, if anybody. Yeah, and it also depends on exactly what you're getting in return. Like, the move night for sure, well... Knight was one of the depth forwards for Adirondack. So even if you're trading him for Drew Shore, well, Shore was sixth in the entire AHL in points. So you can slot him in one of the top lines in Adirondack if you're keeping him down there, and he will generate offense. So, you know, just on, like, the Adirondack viewpoint, you're trading a guy who had, like, a dozen points for a guy who had 30. Well, that... You know, it's trading a third liner for a first liner. Speaking of Drew Shore, um, the AHL All-Star rosters have been announced, and Drew Shore is one of three Adirondack Flames to go to the AHL All-Star game. Um, the other two are Yoni Ordio and Emil Poirier. So hopefully the Flames, I don't know how it works, if you have to be actually on the AHL roster, or if they can just kind of, I guess they'd probably have to send him back to Adirondack for a couple of days, let Ordio play in that game and bring him back up. Do you know how that works? Uh, you would have to send them down for that. Okay. So hopefully they'll at least send them down for that. I think that we're at a point now where with two other goalies that are good, we can afford to send them down for that. I'd want them to play in the HL All-Star game. Yeah, I recall the Flames uh, before when Curtis McElhinney was recently called up as the backup that they sent him down, and I think they recalled uh, Matt Keatley for the day or two for McElhinney to get the start in the All-Star game, and then they swapped them out. McElhinney made it to an All-Star game? Yeah. Wow. He was one of the top AHL goalies back then, so... Wow. Yeah. You know, I'm really proud to see Emil Poirier in there, too. I mean, he hasn't played a full season, um, but every game he's played in, he's looked fantastic. Yeah. And, like, on Calgary Puck, someone was inquiring, like, because they haven't heard a lot about Poirier's speed, and I said it's like uh, Alex Tangay. Like, you wouldn't be complimenting him on his passing ability because it gets a little redundant. And it's the same thing with Poirier and his speed. Like, he's just buzzing all the time, and, you know, it is nice to watch. Yeah, and, I mean, when we see that, that deal there with Poirier... I think of the two big trades that we made in 2013 for draft picks to get the Calgary Flames into the draft. We got Monaghan in the first round, as we all know. We got Poirier, and we got Klimchuk. And, you know, two of those three, and at least Monaghan and Poirier, are turning out very well, which is really nice to see. Yeah, Poirier, he's really looking like he'll be a top-quality top-six forward, not just a filler guy. So... It'll be nice to see once he reaches the NHL if he has chemistry with a guy like Monaghan or whomever, really. And, you know, it'll be a nice addition to the Calgary Flames once he gets recalled. Yeah, and we're going to have to wait a little bit for Klimchuk to at least reach the AHL level to know how the third pick turned out. Can you see Poirier getting recalled here after the trade deadline? I would actually be somewhat shocked if he didn't. I think they're going to have to manage that carefully. They can't do what they've done in the past and gut the farm team to bring all the guys up if they want that team to stay successful. But I think that they'll probably bring a couple guys up and send them back down and then bring a couple more guys up. Because what was it, last year or the year before, when the Flames called up so many guys from uh, the farm team at one point that they had to go out and find replacement players? Yeah, well, 
I know that you're only allowed four recalls after right. the trade deadline, so right. maybe the like I know that you have to if the players are going to be eligible for the AHL playoffs, they have to be down in the AHL before the deadline. So I think it would make sense to use him as one of the four recalls. I don't think we're going to be in a position where we need to make all four. But, yeah, he'd be a guy I'd be okay to flip up back and forth. Exactly. So, yeah, good to see three uh, three H- or Adirondack Flames in the AHL All-Star game. There's more Adirondack Flames in the All-Star game than Calgary Flames in the All-Star game. But, you know, I think the fact that there's three of them really shows the – depth of our system now we can't take full credit for sure we acquired an all-star there but i think three guys being in the hl all-star game regardless shows that we have a deep system and some good players in that system exactly and hopefully they all transition well once they do get their recalls to calgary well we're already seeing audios working out well exactly another guy speaking of depth um in the system that we've seen i think who's gotten probably more ice time in the last five games than he has any time I can remember any stretch before that is Lance Boma and with Glenn Cross out Lance Boma is the guy who's really been getting uh, the benefit of that I hate to say that but he's benefited from the extra ice time and he's actually been playing in a top six role with David Jones and Sean Monahan. and you did the research he's actually had five points all assists since the Florida game so when you look at Boma's play there do you think he's rising to the occasion yeah, and he's not an untalented player. Like, you know, like the typical fourth line guy, like a Brandon Bullig, you think, oh, well, he's just there to hit people and then that's it. But Boma, he has shown some offensive flair in the past and he can make a quality pass and he has a lot recently with the five assists. You know, I mean, he's really played two full seasons with the Flames last year and this year and up till about this time last year, he was looking to me like just another run-of-the-mill, fourth-line, tough filler guy. And it was the end of last season, and I think this season as well, where I think we're starting to see Bo- or, uh, Boma come into his own and really start to see some of that offensive skill and see a bit more of his determination. I mean, you know, he's always diving in front of pucks when he can, and he's becoming... I want to say a bit more well-rounded player, but I think he's really starting to show he has value outside of just being the the fourth-line scrapper. Yeah, exactly. He's becoming a core player for the Flames, and he's an integral part of the team. And he's developing into a guy that you can put anywhere at any time, and he will chip in. Yeah, and I mean, up till about this time last year, um, I thought, you know what, if we wanted to move him, we could find somebody to replace him, and I didn't think he was that integral. But yeah, I think now he's becoming a guy that you're going to see here for a while, a guy you're going to see in a Flames jersey, who, like you said, you can put him in different roles, and he can fill in. I don't think he's a top six guy you'd want with Monaghan and Jones for a long stretch, but I think he can fill in there when he needs to. Exactly. And if he can at least get the opportunity once now and then and fill in and perform, that's great. And, you know, anytime you can have a guy like Boma who can chip in the odd goal or assist, like, that's useful because injuries do happen. And, like, especially, like, in a playoff series down the road. Like, you remember in 2004 when, like, pretty much half our team got decimated we had guys that could step up and fill in like a guy like sean donovan and lance bulma's kind of taking that mantra of the guy that can if he's given the opportunity generate some offense yeah you know when i look at lance bulma and i look at his play style and kind of where he is in the roster i compare him a lot to a better version of eric nystrom I think for uh, Eric Nystrom, I I don't think is where he was at one point, but I think that when he was with the Flames, he was a th- you know a third line guy who you could have step up for short periods. We'd see a flash of brilliance in him. He was that kind of filler guy to me. So I don't know who would you compare Boma to? Brandon Prust, but I think Lance Boma has a little bit more offense in him. See, and I and I would agree with Prust, but not Prust as a flame. I think no. the Flames misused Brandon Prust and tried to make him a fighter. 
So if I'm comparing him to a, a flame of the past, I think he's a better version of Nystrom. But yeah, I agree with you. I think that he is like Brandon Prust is now. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And he's kind of our do over on Brandon Prust. Yeah. And you need guys like when you're in a playoff series that can a throw a hit and B put the puck in if the opportunity arises. So, you know, it's good that, as we said, that he's earned the opportunity. I think he's been a guy that we've noticed all season with, you know, his diving. He was even wearing the face mask for a while because he was diving so much. So I think he's earned that shot to get a chance in the top six. And I'm glad to see that he's getting rewarded for it. Yeah. Well, like last night against LA, there was one penalty kill where like he dived in front of the puck and stopped it from getting through. And like it helped to disrupt their entire power play. So even if he's not generating points on the score sheet, like if he can block shots like that, it, a goal saved is a goal earned in my book. So it's interesting. Yeah, you're right. I think he is uh he's a guy who can do what fighters used to do with the fighting and even guys like McGratton to turn the team around without dropping the gloves. I mean, a lot of the fighters job, especially here in Calgary, we've seen has always been to, turn the momentum around and that sort of thing. And I think Boma's doing a lot of that job without actually dropping the gloves. Mm-hmm. Boma, it's interesting. I'm just looking on the Flames site. Uh, he has 15 points so far this season in 44 games, which is tying his career high from last year of 15 points in 78 games. So he's definitely, I mean, he's going to get at least a point this year. So this is going to be a career year for him as well, which is awesome. Yeah. And anytime you can have a third, fourth line guy producing at a 30 point pace or even close to that, like that's amazing, really. Yeah. No, it is. You're right. And I I think he's going to be a guy we're going to see in a flaming sea for a while. I think he likes being here and he's going to be cheap enough, even when we start putting some money back on the books. We'll be able to keep him here for a while. Oh, yeah. Well, Matt, anything else you want to chat about? No, I'm good. It was a good week. It, it was a great week. It's been a fun week to be a Flames fan. It's been, you know, a fun week to watch some of these finishes the Flames had. And last night in L.A., I was watching the overtime, and I I, I thought we were going to take it to shootout, and I didn't know that we could beat Jonathan Quick in a shootout. Oh, I know. Well, I think everybody was a little confused on that game-winning goal by Weidman. Well, yeah, and it, it's so weird. I mean, it was such an anticlimactic finish. You know, you kind of want the off the post and into the net, and that's the finish. And I remember kind of, you know, sitting up in my chair being like, yeah, oh, what? Play's resuming. And then the ref comes and says, good goal for Calgary. And it was just this weird finish to the to the emotional night that the Flames were having and the fans were having. Oh, I know. Like, you're getting ready for the faceoff in the offensive zone after the icing and... Then, oh, the ref's pointing at center ice. Okay, well, I guess we won. Woo. <laughs> and then you heard, I don't know if you heard it, but the uh, the ref came on as a little speaker and said, good goal, Calgary. And, you know, that was it. Like, it was just such a weird end to that game. Oh, I know. But, hey, two points is two points. We'll take it. <laughs> but, you know, if you look at any game, I guess, so far this season that really sums up the Flames season in 60 minutes, I think it's that one. Mm-hmm. I mean, both goals on that, you know, the Monaghan goal was kind of a fluky goal. Um, the team didn't play well, but they found the way to win. And in the end, they got the really weird face or they got the really weird overtime goal from Dennis Weidman, no less. So I think that if there's a game that really, you could say, sums up the season, you're getting the winner from a guy you're not going to expect to get the winner. You're getting a really fluky goal in the one goal that Monty got. And it's just this lucky almost end to the game. Yeah, and like the Flames were quite on the ropes for most of the game. And like if it wasn't, yeah, if it wasn't for Ordeo, like that game doesn't even come close to reaching overtime. So yeah, yeah, it's it's just a good overall game. And hopefully the Flames can start to push back on other teams moving forward. It's been a different season than we all expected it to be for the Flames, but we can't deny that it's been a fun season. Oh, no. It's been a blast. Like, it, it, you know, we were kind of both expecting that we'd be right around where Edmonton is currently. So we're eating our hat. I mean, we said earlier in the podcast this season, this team will be terrible. Yeah. Well, you look on paper for the Flames, like, okay, our best two forwards are Gaudreau and Monaghan. And they're a rookie and a sophomore. 
Yeah, you're really going to expect the playoff team out of that. And it's been a heck of a ride. Even the lows, even the eight-game losing streak. I mean, it was kind of fun to watch and sit there and go, are they coming back? Can they do this? Can they get out of this? Or is this the end of it? Exactly. And the fact that they've rebounded since then, going 8-3, and three, like that's exceptional. Yeah. And, you know, I think it it's a great thing for all these players to see, look, you don't need star players to do this. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens this summer in the UFA market, see how many guys want to jump into this roster. I think last summer is probably a very undesirable place to come, and I think this summer you're going to be more open to getting free agents wanting to come here. Definitely. And, like, we saw with Colorado last year that they were able to attract a guy like Jerome McGinley onto their roster and after they had such a good season and while they're not as good this year it i think the flames will definitely attract the right types of people next year yeah i I have a feeling that there are probably some free agents the flames were trying to work with that just didn't want to come here and i couldn't blame them after last season but i think after this year especially younger guys who might look at bob hartley as a coach and say yeah i want to be part of that Mm mm-hmm you know, I'm maybe a 4-5 defenseman now, and if I come into this, I have the potential to be a 3-4 guy or a 1-2 guy. Like, I think you're going to see a lot of, especially younger players, who might say, yes, I want to be part of this thing. It's going to be great for my career. And, you know, anytime you can find players that want to join your team and contribute, that's a good thing. Instead of, like, teams that are, or players that are just looking for the bucks. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing I think we're going to see with the Flames is, you're not just going to come here because you're looking for the bucks. You're going to have to be a guy who wants to work hard. And I think everybody knows that. And if you're just looking for a payday, this isn't going to be the place to be. Yeah, there's a team up north that wants to back the Brinks truck up into your front driveway. There you go. So, Matt, if we looked at last week, there were six points on the table last week. You and I both thought the Flames would walk away with a victory from the Coyotes and the Kings. Were we ever wrong? Uh, they ended up getting the Sharks game in there as well. So we at least got those two, but neither of us thought they'd get the San Jose game in the middle. This week's an easy one. We got two points on the table. There's only one game between now and the next time we, we're we talking, and it's the Flames and the Ducks in Anaheim. We are getting two points. For sure, guaranteed. Do you want a bet son on that if you're that guaranteed? No. <laughs> <laughs> but Not that confident. I'm as confident as I will go without putting money on the table. (laughs) All right. My gut tells me it's going to be a loss just because if you look at, I mean, it's Anaheim, it's in Anaheim. They're the best team out there. There's a lot of negative stacked for the Flames right now. Um, So my gut tells me it's going to be a loss, but my head tells me that with Yoni Ordeo in net, with the Flames running on this adrenaline they're on with this four-game streak, and with a big break coming up after it, they can go out there and play hard. It's not like they got to go the next night. They can go out there, they can give it their all. I think they're going to walk away with at least one point. Yeah. I'm not I'm not willing to say they're going to win, but I, don't, I think they're going to get at least one point. Well, the middle of January has been the exception in the Flames' curse. Four of the last five victories in Anaheim have been in the middle of January, so they're going to get their fifth one out of their last six. But the last couple in mid-January, they haven't won either. Yeah, well, that was then. This is now. <laughs> I, I, was, I was in Anaheim last year. I was there at the Honda Center when the Flames played in January. I was stoked to see the Flames hopefully win it, and they couldn't. So, I don't know, maybe I've got a personal bias because of that. Yeah, well, this time's different. We're going to win. Let's hope so. So, two points on the table. I think we're walking away with at least one of them. You think we're walking away with both points. Yep, going to go 5-0 and all on the road trip. And then we come home after that, and we got the we got the Sabres to look forward to. So, it's going to be an easy uh, week for the Flames. Yeah, and hopefully they can get at least six points out of the eight remaining in january wouldn't that be amazing yeah yeah can you imagine if we go on an eight game win streak to end out the month yeah that would make february a lot less fearsome (laughs) yeah it would it would give us a lot of cushion going into february and then we see the kings again in february so i mean there are games we can win in february but yeah we're gonna need that cushion if we can get it yeah and at least in march it's a lot easier i think there's only like six or seven games that are difficult instead of 11 
Yeah, and more breaks again, too. We get two three-day breaks at some points. So. Mm-hmm. Makes it a lot better. Yep. Well, Matt, let's uh, let's hope that the Flames can pull off the win this week. And that next time we talk, we'll be riding on a five-game road winning streak. Yeah, and we can talk about how good Johnny Gaudreau is in the skills competition. We can talk about the skills competition. We can talk about Yoni Ordeo pulling off yet another win and being the you know the next Finnish goaltender for the Flames after Mika Kiprasov. Exactly. So have a good week, everybody, and go Flames go. Enjoy the one game and enjoy the All-Star break, and we'll be back next week. Take care. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.